In this tutorial, I'm going to show you how to properly complete a comprehensive monitoring plan for a small system such as the one shown here. Comprehensive monitoring plans are required for all community water systems and non-transient non-community water systems. These plans must be submitted to DEP by August 19th, 2019. So why are you required to complete this plan? The plans are intended to ensure that systems are collecting compliance samples that are representative of each permitted water source. If you have one source, let's say a well, that goes to a treatment plant and then to the entry point, conducting representative sampling and completing the plan is rather straightforward. Shown here is what we consider a one-to-one -one ratio of source to entry point. You may also have multiple sources, each going to their own entry point, which still falls under the one-to-one -one ratio. You can see here we have source 001 feeding entry point 101 and source 002 feeding entry point 102. Things get a bit more complicated if a system has two or more sources supplying one entry point. This could be a permanent source and also a source identified as reserve that supply the same entry point, for example. These systems complete a different form, Form 2, which we won't cover in this tutorial. DEP is providing training outside of this video for these systems. So this tutorial is geared to systems with the one-to-one -one source to entry point ratio. These systems use Form 1 to complete the comprehensive monitoring plan, which is what we'll cover. For completing your comprehensive monitoring plan, DEP has a form available on the eLibrary, which is linked in this video's description. You can see here I'm downloading the Word version of the form from the eLibrary. There are associated instructions with the form. You aren't required to use the DEP form, but you'd need to capture all the required elements in your own form. You can also open the form as a PDF right from the DEP website, print it, and fill it out by hand if you would like. This Microsoft Word version was created with form fields, so the only place you can make changes is within the gray areas and checkboxes. Everything else is locked down, so you can click right into the shaded boxes. I'll show you this by entering the date in the top left for date plan updated. If I click up here in the title, the cursor goes to the date plan updated field. We'll be completing the comprehensive monitoring plan for a manufactured housing community called Lone Ridge Estates. Let's look at the question before part one. It says, do you have any entry points that are supplied by more than one source? If you answer yes to this, you can't use form one. You'll have to switch to form two to complete your CMP. The first part of the form is for general system information. You can see that I've already filled in a lot of the information. I'll jump down here and finish with the population served and checking that this is a community water system and that the source type is groundwater. Before we start completing part two, I want to show you the Drinking Water Reporting System or DWRS. This website pulls from our internal database, PadWiz, and provides you with the information that DEP has on your sources and entry points, which is what we'll need for part two of the form. The easiest way to get to the DWRS is by searching for DWRS in an internet search engine such as Google. This is what the home screen looks like. From the home screen, choose Selection Criteria at the top of the page. Then highlight the bubble to the left of Public Water System ID. When you do this, a space appears for you to type the PWS ID for your system. So type the PWS ID in the space provided. I'm going to type in a fake PWS ID for the purposes of this demo. Make sure inventory information is highlighted next to information request and click submit. From the next screen, highlight the name of your system in the box to the left by clicking on it. Then under select inventory data report, Click the drop-down arrow. This will bring up a list of options. Select either source information or entry point information from the drop-down box. Click Submit and you'll be taken to a screen that shows detailed information about your sources or entry points if that's what you chose. You will then use some of this information to complete the next few tables in the form. Now that you know how to check DWRS, let's go to Part 2 of the form. In this part, you identify your sources and entry points. 
Now before I get to table A, I want to draw your attention to the availability and type codes table that is at the top of the page. You must choose the appropriate availability and source type codes from this table to enter into table A. The left side of the table lists the availability codes. Under the most recent Chapter 109 Safe Drinking Water Regulations, the availability of each source, treatment plant, and entry point must be designated as either permanent or reserve. There is also the emergency designation, but this is only for entry points supplied by interconnections with another system. Sources cannot have the E designation. If you do choose R for a source that will truly be used as a backup, you will need to submit a request to amend the operations permit. Please contact your local DEP office for more information on amending the operations permit. On the right side of the table are source type codes, which will need to be used to identify what the source type is for each source listed in Table A. These are the codes from the DEP data system. So you can see, for example, G is groundwater and S is surface water. Now let's take a closer look at the first four columns of Table A, all relating to the source. The first column is Source ID. You should provide the three-digit identification number that DEP uses to identify sources. This number is already assigned to any source that DEP is aware of and will begin with zero, for example, 001. As I explained earlier, this is where you want to use the DWRS system to find the ID numbers. Make sure that what you think they are line up with the numbers that DEP has. Here is the DWRS information for our example system, Lone Ridge. The source ID and source name will put right into the CMP form. You can see here that there is also an abandoned source. Lone Ridge had this on an interim status previously, but never used the well. They didn't want to have to monitor the well or make it a reserve well since it had some water quality issues years ago. So it has been properly abandoned by a well driller. If you abandon a well, you should notify DCNR's Bureau of Geological Survey that the well has been properly abandoned. It is also recommended that the public water system notify its local DEP office that the well has been abandoned. For our example, there is only one source and it is 001. We won't list the abandoned well here in the plan since it was properly abandoned. If you have a source the DEP does not have a record of, Leave this column blank for the ID, but you'll capture it in the other columns. The second column is source name. Again, I showed you where you can find this in DWRS. So we'll type well number one here. If this is a source that DEP does not have a record of, then provide a name that you use to identify this source. The third column is source availability code. Use the availability codes located above table A that I showed you earlier. Remember, availability for all sources must be P for permanent or R for reserve. For our example, Lone Ridge, the well is listed as permanent. Now this is important. If one of your sources is not listed as permanent, such as interim or emergency, it will be switched to permanent after August 19th, 2019, and DEP will expect monitoring. So, you need to decide if you want to abandon a source, keep it as permanent, or designate it as reserve. Again, there's a process to designate a source as reserve in the operations permit. So, please speak with your local DEP office about this if you decide to go this route. So for our example, we'll place a P in this column for permanent. The fourth column is source type code. Here you use the source type codes located in the table above table A. For our example, it is G for groundwater well. Now we'll move on to the last four columns of the table, which are all related to the entry point or EP that is associated with the source. This column is labeled Associated EPID. Here you will identify the entry point associated with the source that was described in the first four columns. This number is already assigned to any entry point that DEP is aware of and will begin with a 1. If you are not sure of what ID is assigned to the entry point, this information is available on the DWRS system. 
Here is the EP information for our example. So for the Lone Ridge system, it is ID 101. The next column is EP name. Again, if you are not sure what name DEP has identified for the entry point, use the DWRS website. For our example, it is called WTP EP 101. The next column is EP availability code. To complete this column, use the availability codes above table A. Availability for all entry points must be P, R, or E. Remember, E is only for purchased interconnection entry points. Just like the source, if one of the entry points currently has a different designation, such as seasonal or interim, you should choose which of the three, P, R, or E, best describes the entry point operation. If you are identifying an entry point as reserve or an interconnect as emergency, then you will need to submit a request to amend the operations permit. The final column of Table A is Seller's PWSID. This column only needs to be completed if you are purchasing water from another system. Now I'd like to draw your attention to the question at the bottom of the page, which asks, does the water system have any non-purchase sources or entry points that were not included in the most recent round of compliance monitoring for nitrate, nitrite, inorganic chemicals, SOCs, VOCs, and radiological contaminants. So maybe you have a source and entry point that you had for backup use and it hasn't been monitored. If you'll now be designated as permanent or reserve, you'll need to complete Addendum A. Let's take a brief look at Addendum A. This is a separate form on the DEPE library. Here is an example of the table filled out. You can see that you identify the source or entry point ID, and then you indicate when monitoring last occurred for these contaminants. You are asked to attach these results. So again, this addendum is only for sources or entry points that you have not monitored during the last compliance period, and you plan to begin using this source or entry point. In the last column, you indicate if the source has any known water quality issues, and maybe that is why it hasn't been used. Let's get back to the main form and go to page 3, which is part 3. Part 3 is for systems with treatment other than disinfection or surface water filtration installed. So, for example, nitrate treatment. If you don't have treatment beyond disinfection or beyond surface water filtration, you can skip this part. Our example system has nitrate treatment, so we'll show you this. In the first column, we indicate that the treatment is at entry point 101. In the second column, we identify the treatment plant ID, which for Lone Ridge is 301. In the third column, you identify the contaminant for which treatment is installed. For our example system, they have nitrate treatment installed, so we'll identify that here. In the fourth column, you identify the type of treatment, so for our example, it is ion exchange for nitrate treatment. The last column is performance monitoring frequency. Performance monitoring under Chapter 109-301 is always required on a quarterly frequency. However, an operation permit may require monitoring on a more frequent basis. Moving on to Part 4, which is called Source to Treatment Plant to Entry Point Schematic. Part 4 contains space for the water system to create a simple schematic of all sources, including any interconnections, and associated treatment plants and entry points. I want to draw your attention to this important note, which states that a water system may submit the system map that is required under Chapter 109.706 in lieu of completing this portion of the plan as long as it contains all the required elements. The key is that the map shows a clear connection between each source, treatment plant, and entry point. Otherwise, DEP is looking for a simple schematic in this part. Here is an example version for our example, Lone Ridge. Let's move to Part 5, which is simply called Attachments. You are expected to attach any of the sample siting plans and monitoring plans that are applicable to your water system. So, for example, you should attach your coliform sample siting plan. 
In addition, you are asked to provide the most recent revision date for each of the attached documents. Part 6 is at the bottom of this page and is where the responsible official signs off on the entire form before it is sent to DEP. Once you have completed the form, it must be submitted to your local DEP office by August 19, 2019. For your local office address, the Form 1 Instructions document contains a link to all the local district offices sorted by county, which I'm showing here. If you have questions about filling out the form or sending it to DEP, you can call your local DEP sanitarium. Your sanitarium may allow you to email a copy of the completed form to DEP rather than using regular mail. If you do not know your sanitarium, use the office list to call DEP. Thank you.